Welcome to the LEAD Center for Performing Arts. To assure that everyone enjoys the program, please take a moment to turn off cell phones and other noise-making devices. As a courtesy to those around you, please do not use cell phones during the program to talk, text message, or take photographs. The noise and light emitted from cell phones can disturb other audience members and the people on stage. Also, in order to comply with copyright restrictions, please refrain from taking photographs or using recording devices. Thank you for your cooperation. Enjoy the program. Good afternoon. I'm Don D. Plowman, Dean of the College of Business Administration here at UNL. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this important event this afternoon, and we welcome our panelists as well. You're in for quite a treat, I can tell you right now. We hear a lot about corruption and fraud and waste, sometimes to the point that it's uh, overwhelming. This afternoon, you're going to get a chance to hear from four very courageous leaders whose stories, I think, will move all of us. This project is called the American Whistleblower Tour, and it is brought to us by a group called the Government Accountability Project. This is a group dedicated to doing something about fraud and waste and corruption. They're focused on trying to improve ethical decision making, something we're very committed to here at UNL. I think you're going to, another thing they're trying to do is counter sometimes what are negative thoughts or assumptions about whistleblowing. We want you to think differently about whistleblowing. You may be in a position someday to step forward and tell the truth. And the stories you're going to hear this afternoon will be helpful. The other thing that this group is uh, dedicated to is trying to encourage more research and thoughtful conversation about whistleblowing. And so the fact to the faculty in this audience and future students, I encourage you to think about this and think about ways in which we can all become part of this conversation. At this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Lewis Clark, the president of the Government Accountability Project. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the kind introduction. We are so excited about being here in Lincoln, Nebraska, not just because it is the heart place of America, the heartland of America, but also because every night here in Lincoln, social activists call our members. Social activists from the Hudson Bay Company <laughs> call our our donors and our members and get them involved in protecting whistleblowers. And so uh, we, particularly in our office, are found the saying, go Huskers. But we're talking about that team <laughs> in particular. And also, um, we are very pleased uh, to have an opportunity to start this tour right here uh, in this place, Lincoln, Nebraska, where so much of our support comes from through their calling. And what they're doing is they're convincing our members to change the face of America in terms of the legislation. Uh, they have helped us to convince Congress to pass the Sarbanes whistleblower provisions, uh, the Sarbanes Oxley uh, whistleblower provisions, uh, to try to finally have state-of-the-art whistleblower protection in terms of the health care bill, in terms of the Stimulus Act, uh, in terms of the Dodd-Frank uh, 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 Wall Street reform, in terms of the reauthorization of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. There has been, in the last few years, a revolution in the change of the law, in part because of what gets animated uh, through the calling coming out of Lincoln, Nebraska. Also, I would like to say a special thanks to the actually nationally acclaimed uh, ethics center or e ethics program uh, here at the College of Business Administration, the College of Law, and the College of Journalism and Mass Communications. They have brought us here and have convinced you to come as well. So we're very pleased um, to be a part of their program today. So who are these whistleblowers? They are just like you and me, 
ordinary people caught up in extraordinary circumstances. When they are faced with an ethical dilemma, they choose to do what is right, not what is easy, not what is expedient, not what others often do, stay mum and lay low. Also, contrary to common percep perception, most work within channels. It is when those prove to be deceptive and deficient and defective that they end up becoming whistleblowers, perhaps internal or external to the agency or the company that they're a part of. We at GAP have helped thousands of whistleblowers over the years since our first creation uh, in 1977. One such, blew, uh, one such whistleblower blew the whistle on the Vioxx drug, a billion dollar drug that also killed 45,000 people and gave 135,000 people heart attacks and strokes, or strokes. Also, we represent a Pentagon whistleblower who blew the whistle on the bureaucratic deficiencies that led to these huge delays in sending over to Iraq for our troops the proper vehicles to protect them against roadside bombs. We also represented a whistleblower in a t peanut company factory uh, who, whose company was absolutely filthy and contaminated that led to the death of people who received peanut butter injections that were filled with salmonella contamination and um, led to death. And the, one of the emails in that particular case was a manager sending an email to another manager uh, that ended up saying, well, I'm glad that shipment's out of here. Let's just cross our fingers. Public education is what this tour is all about. We're here to show you why whistleblowers are necessary, why they need protections, and why they should be honored for their courage. With that, I'm pleased to introduce today's all-star panel. We have two high-profile whistleblowers, a, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, and a whistleblower who is one of the nation's foremost whistleblower rights advocates. First, the panelist. And I'm going to do something here a little bit different. Gary, would you please stand up? In 2006, Gary, uh, Gary rocked the financial world by exposing the SEC's failure to properly investigate an insider trading scheme involving one of the country's biggest hedge funds. As a SEC lawyer, Gary recommended that former hedge fund CEO John Mack testify under oath, but Gary was told that Mack's powerful political connections would make this difficult. Gary didn't back down and was fired. He helped spark a congressional investigation, which resulted in eventually vindication by the Senate and eventually national media attention. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary uh, Gary. Next, Tom, would you stand up? Thomas Drake is a former senior official at the National Security Agency, the NSA, who helped reveal to the press that a data collection program had threatened Americans' privacy rights and cost taxpayers $1.2 billion, although today I learned it was $4 billion, before it ultimately failed and produced nothing. For his actions, Drake was persecuted and prosecuted. His house was raided, and he was charged under the Espionage Act, a law meant for spies. And he faced 35 years in prison, in June, the case against him fell apart, and he accepted a plea deal to a minor misdemeanor. The judge admonished the Department of Justice's efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Drake. <laughs> now,
Next, Mike, please stand up. A good reporter who seeks the truth can be invaluable to a whistleblower. Mike McGraw is a great reporter. Winner of the Pulitzer Prize, he is the Special Projects Desk Reporter for the Kansas City Star. Mike's coverage over the past few years of a whistleblower at the Offutt uh, Air Force Base here in Nebraska was pivotal in helping to expose a dangerous breakdown in maintenance of planes used for intelligence missions over Iraq and Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike McGraw. Last, but certainly not least, Jesselyn, please stand up. Jesselyn Raddock, today's moderator, is a former ethics advisor to the Justice Department who disclosed that the FBI committed ethics violations and that the Attorney General personally misled the American people about the interrogation of American Taliban John Walker Lind she is now GAF's National Security and Human Rights Director, where she recently served as counsel for Tom Drake. Jesselyn is one of today's leading whistleblower rights advocates. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesselyn Raddock. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jesselyn. Thank you, Louis. I'm excited to be here in Lincoln and present this phenomenal panel. Whistleblowers come from all sorts of industries, healthcare, government, Wall Street. The truth doesn't share a border with the company door. But no one I know goes into a job expecting or planning to be a whistleblower. And whistleblowers can face some pretty tough and unique decisions. Questions of loyalty immediately pop up. Should I keep my mouth shut for the good of the organization? Or should I do what's right for the public? Or should I go along to get along? How will these decisions affect my family? What's going to happen to me? Will it really make any difference in the long run or in the short run? The common thread for whistleblowers is that they are employees with both integrity and expertise who speak up when they see something is wrong. Often, they are the only ones to speak up, even though lots of people might know about the wrongdoing. Gary, I'd like to start with you. How long were you working at the SEC before you discovered the hedge fund case, and what were you doing? Actually, I'd been there two days, and um, I was assigned a case uh, that involved a mid-level portfolio manager at what had been one of the, or it was one of the uh, largest hedge funds in the world. Uh, I checked around the SEC and found there had been a flow, a stream of these complaints from the, exchanges around the country, the New York Stock Exchange, the uh, NASDAQ, uh, American Stock Exchange, and they'd all been gathering dust. Nobody had investigated them. And when you were told that you weren't supposed to interview a certain gentleman by the name of John Mack, what were your first thoughts? Well, that was a tough decision. Um, there were two thoughts that went through my mind. First of all, uh, what was the right thing to do? Uh, the SEC regulations don't distinguish between Wall Street elite and others. They say enforce the securities laws. That was also my oath to enforce the securities laws. On the other hand, as I began to look into the case, I very quickly realized that the direction to stop the case was not coming from uh, a level above me or two levels above me. It was coming from the top down. And that meant it was scary because I would eventually be bumping heads with the top of the division if I continued. So my first, my first choice was I didn't come here to fight the SEC. I came here 
to work at the SEC and enforce the securities laws. So I began to think about leaving the commission. Eventually, I decided to stay and take it on, and that, uh, <laughs> that was a series of decisions. Each one of them took me into a new battleground. Tom, you discovered a data collection program at the NSA that has some pretty serious problems. What was wrong with it? And can you contrast it with other programs that may have worked better? I unfortunately discovered in the few short weeks after 9-11, a period in our history that we need to deeply reflect on going forward in terms of who we are as Americans. But I discovered that at the highest levels of this government, that the White House had entered into an agreement with the National Security Administration to bypass the Constitution and use a program to turn the United States into the equivalent of a foreign nation for the purpose of electronic surveillance, completely upending a legal regime that had been in place for the previous 23 years, a regime that was put in place specifically to deal with significant abuse and illegalities committed by the U.S. government during the 60s and 70s and the Watergate era. I also knew that there was a legal alternative, a program, a revolutionary breakthrough program called Thin Thread that not only had the Fourth Amendment protections in it, but would also provide superior intelligence in terms of providing for the national security interests of this country. Can you tell us how you tried to expose these problems? The first thing I did is I went to the number three person at NSA and I was referred to the Office of General Counsel. This is in the, again, this is in October of 2001. And I was informed by that General Counsel that it was all legal. The White House had approved it and I was not to pursue any further interest in the program, as it was called. How did your supervisors react when you brought it up with them? They clearly were concerned that I was bringing this to their attention. And on the other hand, I knew that a fateful decision had been made to go to the dark side with an agency that had incredible power, a power that you would never want to have turned on the United States of America without significant controls. In this case, there were no controls. And so that began a whole series of investigations involving two 9-11 congressional investigations, which I was a material witness, as well as a multi-year Department of Defense Inspector General investigation. For both of you, Gary and Tom, did you ever consider not blowing the whistle? How difficult was the decision to speak up? And did either of you discuss this difficult decision with your loved ones ahead of time? Well, yes, the, uh, at the very threshold, when I was told that this individual had powerful political connections and that it, as a practical matter, it was not gonna be possible to take his testimony uh, and assess the fact that it went all the way up to the top of the agency. I discussed it with my wife, who happened to be uh, pregnant at the time uh, with twins. And at that point, uh, I considered leaving the agency because there was only three options. Fight it, which meant taking on the division all the way to the top, leaving the agency, or becoming complicit in the decision, participating in, in it. And so uh, eventually I went to the uh, associate director uh, level, which was three notches up, and basically said, that I was aware that the investigation was being stopped for political purposes and followed it up with an email, which uh, I, you know, at that point I had had uh, very positive reviews of my work over the past year. So the first thing that happened is they tried to uh, issue another uh, evaluation of my work. It eventually resulted in my firing and I look back on that decision uh, with, let's say, some satisfaction because had I done it differently, I think I would have been haunted by 
a decision to walk away the rest of my life. And it may have changed who I was. And how about you, Tom? I was brought up in the Republic of Texas as well as the First Republic of Vermont. And my father always told me that honesty was the best policy. I would have been fundamentally complicit in government illegality and massive abuse if I had not stood up. I took the oath four times in my career, twice in the military, Air Force, Navy, once as a CIA, in the CIA as an analyst, and then as a senior executive assigned to the National Security Agency. I did not take an oath to protect illegalities. I did not take an oath of fealty to an institution, nor did the President of the United States. I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America and do so faithfully. So I would have been complicit if I had not said anything. Conscience was clear in that regard. In terms of family, no one in my family knew what I had, had discovered and what had been brought to my attention. I mean, we're, we're talking about choices and de strategic decisions being made by the very highest levels of the government in secret and mass by about as top secret a program as you could label within the government. That's interesting. As a whistleblower myself, I had not told my family about my decision to blow the whistle. I wanted them to have plausible deniability and I didn't want them to become wrapped up in this morass that was soon to follow um, inevitably from blowing the whistle. Mike, I know you've worked with whistleblowers before. What do you look for in determining whether a whistleblower is correct about their concerns? Like anyone who comes to a journalist, I, I question motives. Almost everyone that comes to journalists has an ax to grind of some kind. Very seldom do we get people coming forward because they can't countenance what's going on because of their conscience. But as a journalist, I don't really care too much what the motive is. I just care whether they're right or not. So I vet them as much as I can. I ask for paperwork. I ask for documents. I ask for photographs. Um, and, and I sit down with the whistleblower and say, look, we're, we're on this journey together. Your reputation's at stake. So is mine and my newspapers. I have to know everything about you that could come out when they come after you, and they will come after you. But I must say, after years and years of being a reporter and working with numerous whistleblowers, it's amazing to me how people can stand up and have the courage to go against the culture that they're working in, the culture that's all around them. And um, I, I really have to congratulate these people for, and you for coming forward despite incredible pressure. Um, so to answer the question, I always look for documents, anything that can back it up, and we have a talk about what the consequences will be. I appreciate that. I'm heartened to hear you're not looking um, so much at the motives because unfortunately by the time a whistleblower is going to the press, they're often pretty ticked off because complaining through internal channels has not worked. And if that was the barometer for deciding whether or not to dig into a case, uh, there would be a lot fewer stories about this. Um, as far as journalism ethics are concerned, do you always have to contact individuals at the company or the government agency that is allegedly involved in the wrongdoing? Yes, as a journalist, and, and given the way I practice journalism, I always have to do that. I, have to, I usually lay out the story for my sources before it's run. I don't want any surprises. Uh, and that's a good way to keep from making errors. But I must say that uh, being on this journey with a couple of whistleblowers in the past has really opened my eyes to the kind of pressure they're under. And I can, in my own case, with the whistleblower at Offutt, a very courageous gentleman named George Saris, he came forward with information about maintenance problems on 50-year-old aircraft that are flying around the most sophisticated spy equipment in the world. And he was concerned about the air crews and he was concerned about foreign governments getting the equipment and he wanted to tell his story because he tried to go through the right channels. Mm -hmm. He wanted to tell his story. So when I went up to Offutt to talk to the officials there, I was met by uh, at least 15 or 20 top level Offutt Air Force officials. They took me into a conference room and sat down and I think there was more brass in that one room than you'd see at Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> and they wanted to convince me that I was just listening to, as one of them called him, Mr. Cranky Pants, and I should just go on and forget about it. 
I'm glad I didn't. And in full disclosure, Saris is a, a client of GAPS, uh, the Government Accountability Project. Now that we have a sense of the types of issues that get factored into whether to blow the whistle or not, let's talk about what happens during the time when you are blowing the whistle. Um, Gary, after you were fired, you eventually went to both the media and Congress. How did you decide to do that? Who did you go to first? And what was the most important? Well, actually, I didn't go to the media first. Uh, my first stop was with Gap. And Gap took me over to meet with Senator Grassley's staff. And fortunately for me, through a quirk, uh, I would attribute it to my lack of skill with computers, I had a PST on the computer which contained all of my emails going back and forth with SEC staff that told the story. And I showed those emails to Senator Grassley's staff, and that, that more than anything opened their eyes to the investigation and caused them to move forward. Uh, the media came later. Uh, there are SEC statutes and implementing regulations that really prohibit an SEC employee from discussing material non-public information. How it got to the media was through, from what I understand from the New York Times, a staff person on the banking committee released it to a New York, a New York Times reporter. Uh, he was also a Pulitzer winner and he, uh, uh, Walt Bogdanich and Gretchen Morganson wrote an article based on the letter that I had sent to the banking committee that was on the front page of the New York Times. I did not uh, comment on that article, nor did I say anything to the media for six months. And my first communication to the media was after a public hearing and after all of this had been aired. And by the way, after I'd been attacked by the SEC on national television, uh, they brought in my whole lineup of supervisors who were immune from any liability for liable or anything else. They could just say whatever they wanted because it was before a Senate committee. That later the next day, I went on public television to respond to it. Tom, what can you say about the role of the media in your case? I think it's crucial to share uh, with you all that in the end it was really the media that really shone a spotlight on the gravity of my case and also what was at stake in terms of the First and Fourth Amendment. It was ultimately the media, both mainstream media as well as alternative media and a lot of the other social media outlets. For example, a Save Tom Drake Facebook page was created and I did not, did not know for several months who was behind it. They were so concerned, it turned out, about my case, they decided to create a Facebook page. There was a number of other bloggers who emerged as a result of a lot of back-channel communication. And it was really the alternative media, the new social media that has come out onto the, the digital age and internet landscape that were crucial in br bringing to themselves the attention of the mainstream media. And it was ultimately the mainstream media in combination with the alternative media they were able to really shine a white hot spotlight on just what in the heck was going on here with this case and why was the Obama administration making such a big deal out of it? I think both Tom and I felt that the media was one of the saving graces in our case. And I'm wondering, Mike, what are some common forms of retaliation you've seen taken against whistleblowers? Things I wouldn't have even imagined uh, to begin with. In, in George Saris's case in Offutt, uh, at a time when, when and I, George has told me I can get into this a little bit, but at a time when he had just found out his wife had beaten cancer and it was the happiest time of his life, they tried to portray him as suicidal so that I wouldn't believe him. Uh, they took away his security clearance, which of course he hasn't gotten back yet, and they assigned this veteran aircraft mechanic to work in the uh, post in, in, in the uh, gym at Offutt, 
and clean the lockers. I, I couldn't believe what they were doing to him. In another case in which a sonar technician came forward and talked to me about problems with the sonar array system on a nuclear attack submarine, they blacklisted that guy after they got rid of him. And I, we had a picture at the Hartford Current when I worked there about his case. We have a picture of him riding on the back of a garbage truck. They blacklisted him and they didn't want him to work anywhere. And lastly, I'll mention a, a fellow who's passed now, a, bill, a fellow named Bill Lehman, who was a meat inspector on the Canadian border. His job was to keep bad meat from coming in from Canadian packing houses and entering the U.S. market. He found so many problems that he, the USDA prohibited him from using a flashlight inside the trucks that came over the border. So Bill started using a coal lantern. Wow. Um, are you worried, Mike, about threats of retaliation that can be aimed at you as a journalist um, who are working with whistleblowers in terms of being forced to, or pressured to reveal sources and to what means and limits are you willing to go to protect your sources? I think every journalist has to be honest enough with a whistleblower to sit down with him and say, look, what's going to happen if I have to sit on the stand and tell a judge I'm not going to give him your name? What's going to happen? What are you going to do? What am I going to do? If I cannot reveal that person's name no matter what, then I need to have a talk with my editor and our law firm and decide whether to go forward and how to go forward. But we have to always maintain an honest relationship with that whistleblower. In the case where we use a whistleblower's name, like we did in George Saris's case, I had a talk with my editor and I said, look, this guy's going to come forward. He's going to let us use his name. He's going to have all kinds of retaliation from the Air Force. I need you to tell me, my editor, that when that starts, that you consider that newsworthy too. What happens to him is newsworthy just like the original issue he blew the whistle on. And I won't go forward with the story unless he makes that agreement. I certainly appreciate that. Um, when I blew the whistle to a journalist in Newsweek and he did a story and then the retaliation came down in full, including criminal investigation, referral to the state bars in which I'm licensed, and being put on the no-fly list, I said, why is that not newsworthy? And he, he said, it, it's, it's not. They're just messing with you, as if it's okay to just mess with an American citizen. So thank you for that stance. Um, Tom, I was wondering how did your peers treat you, and where did you eventually end up working once you were gone from the NSA? It's fair to say for a number of former colleagues, I was radioactive. Um, NSA had sent out uh, a message to the workforce when I was indicted, and it, was, it really painted me in extraordinarily dark terms. So there was many colleagues, um, who, they did not know the previous two and a half years prior to the indictment, but once the indictment hit, then they were avoided me at all costs. Uh, others thought there must be something to the government's case. Why would they have gone to such trouble to indict him, especially since five of the charges uh, were under the Espionage Act? And, f and furthermore, um, once I was indicted, that meant that obviously I was damaged goods. And so there was a number of other colleagues who, if they did support me, they had to do so quietly because they were at risk and knew they were at risk because by virtue of the indictment, the federal government through the Department of Justice was sending a most chilling message. You do anything like this and we'll come after you with the full force of what we have at our disposal. To bring this full circle, it reminds me, when I blew the whistle, a number of friends who still worked at the Justice Department said, I'm still your friend, I still want to be friends, but don't email me at work. And this was back in 2003, and I said, why? Do you think they're, someone's listening in on this stuff? And um, it, it turned out to actually be true. Um, no, I ended up resigning from the NSA in 2008. Uh, pretty significant salary as a member of the senior executive and a complete loss of income. I also had to acquire the services of a very expensive attorney. I knew that the legal jeopardy that the government had placed me in was significant enough that I was going to have to defend myself with everything I had. 
And that meant not just the loss of income, but also having to take out a second mortgage on my home eventually, as well as going through all of the liquid assets that I have available to me, including investment income. So in terms of a job, I went from the peak of my earning career and earning power and five years, within five years of retirement from the US government to having no job at all, no prospect of a job with the US government, given the fact that I was not only under prosecution, but eventually under indictment. And so it, there were attempts by me to find jobs. I ultimately, and this is actually one of the interesting silver linings, I ended up working full time at an Apple retail store in the greater DC area, where I now continue to work as a full time expert. I also was teaching part time at Strayer University. Ironically, the last class that I taught there before they let me go was focused on the 1970s, Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers, Watergate, and massive abuse and illegalities conducted by the Nixon administration, the Church Pipe Committees, FISA, the formation of two standing committees um, on intelligence in both the House and the Senate to provide the oversight necessary in terms of the secret side of the US government. And so I was let go, speaking of you know, the halls of academic freedom, why? Because I was informed by the academic dean they did not want to have any disruption on campus. Gary, um, would you say that a lot of workers at your agency knew or at least suspected the kind of wrongdoing that you uncovered? Um, that's a tough question. The, but the answer is yes. I think everybody knows <clears throat> that cases are uh, moved along to a certain point, they look promising, and they disappear. Now, a lot of folks don't know why they disappeared. They just sort of disappear. Uh, I also represent whistleblowers now, <clears throat> and uh, one is Darcy Flynn, who's uh, been the focus of considerable media attention. Uh, he tells how uh, he was involved in an investigation a decade ago of a Wall Street bank and its chief executive officer that uh, the investigation had been cleared for a filing of a complaint against uh, the CEO and the bank and suddenly and abruptly the head of the enforcement division recused himself, the case was blocked, and he flipped sides and went to work for the other side. Now he knew about this case and it troubled him for a long time. And finally, this last year, he stepped out and talked about it. And he's told me that, you know, people were stunned by what happened. But it took him a while to step forward because of the revelations about the SEC in the last couple of years, he began to think, yeah, maybe that really did happen just like it looked like it happened. I didn't imagine it, it really happened. And the fact that nobody else has spoken out doesn't mean it didn't happen. So he spoke out and that's now under investigation. And Tom, why do you think so many people don't speak out? They might lose their job. Um, many people identify with the institution. It's the place they work, it's the place they make friends, they have colleagues, they have all, a lot of activities they engage in outside of work. Work becomes a centerpiece of their life. They have, they have children, they have kids going to college, they have mortgages to pay. There's any number of reasons, and especially if they're not the ones making the decision, especially if they're ones that weren't the ones doing the wrongdoing. <coughs> they can psychologically sort of protect themselves by saying, well, it's someone else's problem. It's not mine. And sort of the monkeys, you know, the three monkeys, hear no, see no, you know, speak no. They just hide from what's actually going on. There's any number of things. And yet if that's the case, then who is gonna stand up? Who is gonna speak out? And particularly in institutions where, in my case, it serves the public. As secret as the National Security Agency is, I'll be the first to tell you that it's, vicious, it's 
its mission is vital to the national security of this country. It has a distinct role to play, but you can't use that secrecy to engage in wrongdoing. And you certainly can't use that secrecy to hide embarrassment and, and malfeasance and management wrongdoing. You certainly don't use that secrecy to redistribute billions and billions of dollars on a program called Trailblazer, which was never d deployed. It never actually provided any national security to the United States, when in fact you had a, an incredibly breakthrough revolutionary program that essentially did everything that that program did. There is an accountability. I had a fiduciary accountability as a senior executive and as executive program manager to ensure that the American taxpayer monies were spent wisely, were spent accountably, and were spent responsibly. We owed that to the American public. For all of the pain that both you, Gary, and Tom have gone through, your cases are considered to be success stories. And we often see in the media portrayals like Aaron Brockovich. But you were, you were successful in getting a message out. But often you have to surround yourself with communities of support to do that. And I'm wondering what institutions were able to help you get the message through. Um, was it the whistleblower advocacy groups or the media or c Congress um, or, or faith? I'm, what, where did you go to help get your message out? Well, I think it's fair to describe uh, several elements uh, that more or less amplify the message. The first in my case was Congress. They began to look into it. And the fact that Congress was looking into it made it interesting to the media. So we have the Finance Committee looking into my allegations, and then the Banking Committee releases a letter of mine that describes in detail how this investigation was blocked for political reasons, and that winds up in the hands of the New York Times. So it goes on the front page of the New York Times. Then the Judiciary Committee reads the New York Times, and the next thing I know, I get a call from the Judiciary to come in and testify. So then I'm testifying before the Judiciary Committee. And then the Wall Street Journal gets into the act. And so pretty soon, you know, there's 20 articles in the Wall Street Journal and 20 articles in the New York Times, and there's, uh, you know, 35, 40,000 hits on the internet. So, and, and you know, NGO played a, a role in it by connecting me with Congress. And later, they amplified the message on their website. So it builds and builds and builds. Uh, I think what made a difference in my case was I, from probably the fortune of many other whistleblowers is just the sheer luck that I had the documents on my computer that I could show to the Congress, which made them get keenly interested and begin to press the SEC for answers. And when those answers didn't come back, they pressed harder and eventually the media got the message. Well, I'm sitting next to an investigative journalist. And after all was said and done, after many, many years, behind the scenes, following every single path as a whistleblower, including the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act, I was faced in early 2006 with a fateful choice, a choice I could not make lightly, because I knew if I made the choice to contact a reporter even un with unclassified information regarding what I knew were significant and grave concerns about the conduct of the U.S. government at the highest levels, and in, more specifically, the conduct of NSA, it was fraught with peril. Because there were administrative policies in place that, one, you could not contact a reporter in an unauthorized manner unless it had already been cleared ahead of time, under any circumstances. So at a minimum, I would be in violation of an administrative policy, although I would not be in violation of any other law. Now, if I was to give class of information to reporter, then yes, I would be in violation of things like, potentially, the Espionage Act or other statutes that govern such behavior. But that was not the case here. 
And yet, knowing that I, that I um, was probably under investigation, or could be put under investigation if I were to contact a reporter, knowing what the capabilities of NSA were in tracking journalists' activities, phone calls, emails, and a whole host of other ways to do so, even within this country, knowing all that, in the end, because the issues are of such grave and significant public concern, I made anonymous contact with a reporter from the Baltimore Sun. I, when I went through my own ordeal as being the whistleblower in the case of the American Taliban, John Walker Lind, I also made my disclosures anonymously. And Mike, I wanted to ask you, um, how many whistleblowers initially choose to remain anonymous? And do you think it's better or worse or the same for story effectiveness if they remain anonymous? And there, are there effective ways to deal with those sources? Well, for my purposes as a journalist, I don't like unnamed sources. Readers don't like unnamed sources. They have a tendency to not believe it and believe it's a figment of my imagination or some journalistic uh, uh, conspiracy. Um, so I always like named sources, but I like whistleblowers to know what they what's in store for them if they come forward. In many cases, I have. Uh, relied on whistleblowers to basically write me a map, to draw me a map. Where are the documents I need to go to? What other possible sources can I go to who might be named? What are other alternate ways we can get at this story? And they're off almost always, maybe not in these two cases, but there's almost always alternate ways in the stories I work on to get the information without naming the whistleblower or using an unnamed source. Um, and we'll often rely on those. Do you think most journalists are like you or are more willing to burn a source? I can't speak for most journalists. I would never burn a source. Uh, I, I, my first uh, commitment is to a source and to be honest with them, tell them the truth. And I mean, this is a journey we're on together. Um, so I, I would not do that. And I think any journalist who does is wrong. Um, there are cases in, in law, actually, where a journalist would burn a source, and I think there's a famous, well-known case in, in Minnesota, in which a journalist offered a source anonymity. His editors overrode that decision. They published the story anyway, naming the source, and the source sued uh, under some kind of contract law. I'm not exactly sure what it was. And the source won. So there's good reasons not to burn a source to, in addition to just ethics. Do you ever worry about what's going to happen to a company if the story of a whistleblower gets out? Not so much. Um, I mean, surely you, the consequences in some cases are pretty negative, uh, but I don't think it's the journalist's role to worry about the consequences of a story that tells the truth. If a company or a government agency makes a bad decision, crosses the line, does something illegal, then that's on them. That's not on the whistleblower and it's not on the media. Uh, that's something that came out that, sh that they didn't want to come out, but they've got to live with the consequences. And no, I'm not too concerned about them. Even if the story is going to result in massive layoffs or bankruptcy for the company? Luckily, I've never had to make that decision. Uh, uh, but I don't think that that too often happens. I, I don't know of, of many cases where there were massive layoffs like that. Um, and I would doubt that that's... Uh, a common theme among whistleblower issues. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Tom and Gary, I know you appreciate how isolating it is and lonely to be a whistleblower, and I'm wondering what, what groups were important to you for support um, during your journey and your ordeal. Um, for me, I just, it was before a lot of the social media was available, and so I was getting the cold shoulder from the soccer moms, and People were shunning me at the PTA meeting and things like that, but I really didn't know a lot about advocacy groups or anything like that. So I'm wondering what your sources of support were. In my particular case, it became crucial to go public in the appropriate manner, given that I had been served with such an egregious set of charges in the indictment that was handed down to me by the government in April of two, 2010. And so I had, um, ultimately, long story short, uh, within a couple of weeks, had made contact with an advocacy group, a whistleblower advocacy group. In this case, it was the Government Accountability Project. And it was the Government Accountability Project that ultimately 
were the ones that were able, through lots of other channels, lots of other connections, through their coalitions and other groups, um, sister groups, civ uh, constitutional rights groups, civil liberties groups, they were able to begin electronic um, uh, uh, privacy groups uh, and, and other groups that were monitoring government activity. It was through them in total, but with the leadership of GAP, they were able to begin to turn this around over many, many months. You have to remember, as a single whistleblower going up against an institution called the U.S. government, Department of Justice, serving, you know, representing NSA, has tremendous power. They have a lot in their arsenal, and that's with essentially unlimited resources. In my case, the original investigation that was launched in late December 2005 had five full-time prosecutors and 25 full-time agents dedicated to finding the sources for the information that had been given to Eric Lichtblau and James Risen in that blockbuster bombshell of an article that was published in December of 2005, revealing for the first time the existence of a domestic warrantless wiretapping program, which in itself was only the tip of the electronic surveillance program that had been initiated by the government. Well, in my case, it was a very small group, essentially my, uh, my family. And uh, there was a long period of time, uh, at least it seemed to me, from the pasting I took in the media in December of 2006, when the SEC really came after me uh, and leaked information to, uh, uh, let's say, lies to uh, favored media sources. So there was about eight months that that went on and there wasn't much I could do about it. Uh, and then suddenly the Senate report came out and basically uh, re I mean, they, they held across the board first that i have been fired because I raised the political uh, issue with respect to the suspect and that the SEC had given him preferential treatment. And at that point, some of the financial media that had been negative abruptly went silent. And I would say from, from nearly that point on, the media coverage was, was positive and it was, it was kind of like being over the side of the mountain, but there was a long stretch there that I didn't know how this was gonna shake out. And you, know, you just sort of uh, take it a day at a time. The one place I had no support, although significant efforts were expended, in bringing my case to the attention of a number of senators and congresspersons. They went radio silent. No, no public acknowledgement. In fact, I had a, a family member who actually contacted, who at the time was the presumptive head of the House Judiciary Committee, and a formal response in, in the form of the letter was, was sent to the family member saying, not in my jurisdiction. And many of the senators and congresspersons you would have thought would have at least have been willing to consider the circumstance of my case and what was truly at stake and the massive fraud, waste, abuse, um, management malfeasance and illegalities committed by the U.S. government at the highest levels. You would have thought it would have had significant, even some of the independents, although there were back-channel communications, nothing public. They were not gonna touch this with a 1,000-foot pole. It was just too radioactive. And they were just gonna let the Obama administration have a pass when it came to revealing even illegalities and malfeasance conducted under the label of national security. What would you do differently if you could do anything differently in terms of your whistleblowing? Now that you've had time to reflect on your experience blowing the whistle, would you do it again? And if so, would you do it any differently? Um, I think that uh, looking back on it, it was not uh, a, a pleasant experience taking on the Securities and Exchange Commission. And it was very difficult for my family. Um, 
but I don't know how I could have handled it much differently. Uh, I don't know what I would have been had I simply walked away from this. And odd as it seems, eventually the discussion focused on that. And my wife said, what are you going to be like if you just simply walk away from this and you know, simply throw up, you know, give up and walk away? I might have done, the only thing I think I, I might have done a, a, a slight bit differently is uh, in the way I blew the whistle. I might have waited just a little bit longer in retrospect because <clears throat> I was fired uh, in literally two days before I got over my, pr the one year it's easier to fire somebody. If I'd have waited a little longer it, they probably would not have been able to fire me. I mean, they'd have to really cook up something so it was easier to fire me. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of that I would have changed. I actually would have blown the whistle a lot sooner. But I knew in an agency where you never say anything, especially in public, and even within the system, there was great risks. I mean, I was completely comp compromised in terms of my protected communications, both Congress as well as the Department of Defense Inspector General's office. But in retrospect, I would have blown the whistle, although I had already blown the whistle. What I'm speaking about is having gone to the fourth estate, the press. One of the things in all of this, it was a great stake, and I, this was, I knew this and others did, is that what was under direct assault was the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment. And as a student of history, I could make a very powerful case, as others have, that that was a foundational basis for why this country rebelled against the British crown. If you can't associate, if you can't freely assemble, if you can't share your belief system okay, freely, if you don't have the ability to bring grievances against your own government, if you're not protected in your own persons or your, or your private and personal effects, then that's not a country in which I wish to live. And so the, the primacy of my oath took priority over anything else. Mike, I was wondering what you would recommend for young people in our audience today who might one day be faced with an ethical dilemma in the workplace. Call me. <laughs> uh, I cannot stress enough how hard it is to stand up against the workplace culture. For for George, for Bill Lehman, for these gentlemen, for everyone who does it, because especially in the government, especially in a military setting, the pressures are so incredibly against you, and the retaliation is going to be strong and swift. Um, but as Gary said, you've got to be able to live with yourself after the fact. And if you go along, that's one thing. If you if you let other people go along, and you have to live with that the rest of your life, it's going to be hard, depending on your makeup to live with. I've often always been fascinated with the psychological profile of people like these on stage with me. Did they learn something about right and wrong at their mother's knee that not everybody learned? Um, and I'm just, I, I can't tip my hat enough to the people who have the courage to do this. I've often asked myself if I have the courage to do it. And I think it all depends on your personal makeup and whether you can live with yourself by not doing it. I think you need to find people you trust, whether it's a journalist or a friend or whatever, share the story with them and, uh, or parents or family and decide what you have to do in order to live with yourself. Uh, I'm very disappointed in many ways in the culture and in this current administration. The Obama administration promised hope and it promised transparency. And they've been going after whistleblowers more so than other previous administrations. And I'm disappointed and surprised. And I'd like to see the culture change to the point where you celebrate these things and you encourage people to do the right thing and you tell them this is your right to come forward and we're not going to retaliate against you if we do, if you do. Thank you. I'm not sure how much time we have left. Um, I want to thank all of you so much for being here at this event and for sharing your time with us and with this audience. 
And Mike, thank you for having faith in whistleblowers and making a difference with your stories. Tom and Gary, thank each of you for standing up for the public. With that, I'll turn the microphone back to Louie. Uh, right here. Right there. Uh, Thanks. Let's give him a hand here. Now, I heard several times mention of social media. So there are three things that I would like all of you to consider doing. One is go on our website, whistleblower.org, and look at a petition that we're putting together on behalf of Franz Guile. He's the one who I mentioned earlier who blew the whistle on the failure of the Pentagon to get the vehicles to Iraq that were needed to protect our soldiers. And he is now, he just lost his security clearance, and he's under intense scrutiny and investigation for absolutely nothing but doing his job honoring our soldiers. So if you would consider signing a petition that we're going to send to the Secretary of Defense uh, at, next week. So please consider that. There are two other things, very simple, that I would like you to consider doing. One, because this was the first of, is the first event of our American Whistleblower Tour, a generous donor has said that for every new person coming out of this event who signs up for our, uh, signs up on our Facebook to like the Government Accountability Project, will get a dollar. So that's whistleblower.org, Facebook, please, you know, get us a dollar for every one of you uh, who signs up to like GAP. And there's one other small thing, very similar, and that is that we have a food integrity program to protect the whistleblowers in the food industry. And if you sign up there on foodwhistleblower.org, we also get a buck. So, you know, those are three social media. That's just for starters to get involved uh, in this effort to protect people like we've just heard from today. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it.